turn to Daniel, please. Daniel, the very first chapter. We're going to start with verse 8. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of, uh, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be examined before you and the countenance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. Now in the reading of Daniel, and let me get this thing turned on. In this particular reading, everyone's familiar with it, correct? You've read it at least once since you became a child of God. Somebody better say amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now, I told you this morning that uh, I would uh, say some things that maybe you had not seen this or tried to present it in a little different light for you to understand. So let me start off by saying this, first of all. The story is picking up about 605 BC. And Nebuchadnezzar has been at the city gates. Jerusalem has been under siege. Now the interesting part to me about this story begins actually before this time period. For you see, there was a king by the name of Josiah. And he dies in 609 B.C. He's the last good king of Israel. Now, <clears throat> with this said, what's interesting to me is that there had been a great revival under Josiah. And you see, this great revival had brought Israel, Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, back into prominence because of their faithfulness to God. And God had been blessing them. And it is in this era that Daniel is born. And so Daniel is in the latter part of Josiah's reign. And in fact, when Josiah dies, Daniel is about 10 or 11 years old. Okay, so he's a pretty young fellow. So if you're doing the math, you're figuring that the 605, Daniel is 15 years old. Now, Daniel is going to be carried away to Babylon. But you know, when we look at this story, and if we think about it, maybe we're thinking, you know, it really, it, 
How bad could it be? Jim read about, oh, the king's dainties were, you know, going to be available to him. In other words, the good food of the kingdom were going to be, Daniel could have whatever he wanted. Not only that, but think about this. <clears throat> these, these young Hebrew men are told that they are going to receive all of the instruction of Babylon. What does that mean? Hey, they get a free education. They're going to go to the University of Babylon. It's a three-year degree. And then they're going to have an immediate job in the palace. Now, what's wrong with that? How bad could that be? They're getting a free education, then they get a government job. Right? I mean, how many of us have sent our children to the University of Babylon? Every one of us that have sent a child to a state university has sent them to the University of Babylon where they have been taught ungodly things. But I'll and let me get off that hobby horse now. I don't want to stay there too long, okay? So here is the situation that we look at it and we think, well, okay. But, you know, we see that Daniel's strong in his faith. Just, you know, this little bit of a reading that we had in chapter 1, we, what we see here is that Daniel is strong in his faith. So he's going to do okay at the University of Babylon. He's going to hold on to his faith. He's going to continue to live for his God. Now, what else is going on in chapter 1? Well, have you ever thought, have you ever asked yourself, why, as we know them by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And why Daniel never married? Have you ever wondered why? Well, the answer is right there in the text. Okay? Who is Daniel being trained under? Who's the commander of what? Of the eunuchs? Daniel and his three friends have all been made eunuchs. Now, did you think about that when you read Daniel chapter 1? Or any part of Daniel? These are the cold, hard, biblical facts about what was going on with Daniel. So he's 15 years old, no manhood anymore. He's 15 years old, no girls, no dating, no marriage. Oh, but he gets to go to the University of Babylon. So when I say or said that hopefully you will hear things, see Daniel in the light that you have never seen before, I hope you understand this now as we go through this. All right? Because I've been in the Lord's body for a few years now, and I'm the only one that I'm aware of that was teaching it in the schools to preaching students. And they were like, huh? They did what? <laughs> yeah, that's what they did. So as you look at Daniel and you try to think about it, he's standing strong and this is after he has become a eunuch because his boss is the chief eunuch. You know, Jesus said, uh, when he talked about marriage, divorce, and remarriage and stuff, 
And his disciples said, oh, Lord, this is some tough teaching. Who can hear this? Well, what was it that Jesus said to them? He says, well, you know, some men are made eunuchs at birth. Some men become eunuchs by the hands of men. This is Daniel's case. And some men become eunuchs for the kingdom of God's yeah. sake. Remember that in the gospel, or in the book of Acts, I should say, the Ethiopian eunuch, you see, <clears throat> In the Jewish religion, the eunuchs were not real highly thought of and such. And the reason that that story of salvation is there is one more story to tell you that God is accepting of anyone that comes to him. And anyone that comes to him, we should be accepted, accepting of them. Okay? So this story as we see it, as it begins to unfold a little bit, and maybe I'll go another slide. I, maybe you want to see that. It was, these were very dark days for Judah, and certainly the days got darker for Daniel. And he is charged with all of this learning. And of course, God gives him great wisdom. He gives him understanding. And he and his friends, they all have the, these certain gifts. But then the Bible also tells us that to Daniel, he receives some other special gifts. And... Daniel's character, when we look at him, we keep thinking of him as being, you know, this teenager. You know, by chapter 2, by the way, when you hit chapter 2, three years have passed. Daniel's about 18 when Nebuchadnezzar has his dream. And you know, when you get over to the lion's den, for all of the teachers that teach the little kids and they show this young Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel was my age when he was in the Daniel's, when he was in the lion's den. He's about 70 years old when that happens. And so sometimes when we're reading through the Bible, we just don't understand how much time has passed so swiftly but chapter 1 to chapter 2 is three years. And it is, uh, it's always interesting to me since I've uh, taught it in, in the uh, Bible Institute and such, and when you're trying to read and, and research things about this, that the liberals want to say that Daniel was not written when it was written. They, they want to say it was written about 200 BC because all these things had taken place. And the funny thing is, is that when you're really getting into the study, uh, is that the language that Daniel uses in the book of Daniel is at least two to three centuries older than the language that was being used in 200 BC. So it's obvious, if you do textual criticism, that Daniel's book is written when it was written. And Daniel is the guy writing it. And because of that, uh, liberals don't like that because, I mean, who can see all of that? And by the way, you, you, when you were reading through Daniel, you saw the Apple Valley Church there, right? I know you did. It's in there. Okay? Where is it? Yeah. 
It's not chapter 1. You might say it's chapter 2, verse about 44. <laughs> What's that say, Robert? And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Oh, I think he just talked about the Apple Valley Church. Amen. Okay. He talked about the Highland Church. He talked about the Lord's Church, the kingdom of God. And of course, when we're looking through uh, Daniel, we, there are lots of different things for us to be able to find. I'm going to run through some of these things here and just get over. That's a gives you a nice little picture of how influential Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was at that time. And he had a vast kingdom. Now, the other thing is, about this time, and maybe it's on the next slide, yeah. There, there are strangers in, in a foreign land I know what that's like, and my wife knows what that's like now, okay? So they're strangers in a foreign land, but they're living in one of the most advanced cities in the world at that time. And in fact, Babylon has a population of close to 200,000 people at this time. And they have marvelous buildings and, and all of these kinds of of things that are going on here. And so you can see that the walls were 25 feet thick. That would take a little bit to break through those kinds of walls, all right? So they're a very wealthy city. They're very advanced. There's lots of art and, and, and such. They have all kinds of statues. Of course, they have lots of idols as statues. Uh, but these individuals, they had 100 bronze gates. And so they were very, a very powerful city, a very powerful nation. And the map that I showed you how, was how much territory had been conquered. And of course, we... Most of the time when we look at Daniel, we end up, we look at verses 8 through 13, and then we look a little bit at chapter 2, and we like to look at the story of the three Hebrews thrown into the fire, and, you know, and we like Daniel in the lion's den, and then we say, we got to shut the book down because... You see, we have all of these weird prophecies. But they're not that weird. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to understand the book of Revelation, study the book of Daniel. And you will be able to figure it out in the book of Revelation. Okay? Because Daniel is talking about the kingdom. Of course, in chapter 2, you, you know that dream that he has. You know, you're the head of gold and all of this. And, and of course, by the time you get to chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar's kind of lost his head because, I mean, his head's gotten, you know, real big because he's the head of gold. So, I mean, he's got such a big head that he goes out and builds a statue 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and he overlays it with gold. Now, I don't know how thick the gold was. I don't think it was solid gold. But 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide, and it was a statue of him because he's the head of gold. He was quite taken with himself. And so, and that gets ahead of what I'm really talking about, but there are many fascinating stories in this book. And I, I just, I want you to 
Here's some things that you may not have heard, but to interest you to get into a study and get in and really dig into the book. And I mentioned chapter two in the head of all of that, but you see when you get into the other prophecies, those are prophecies about Greece, prophecies about Rome, and so forth. So they're not that difficult to understand. The imagery that he uses is different than chapter two, but that's what he's talking about. And then of course, uh, you get over to uh, that wonderful chapter that says, I saw the Son of Man ascending in the clouds or going to, you know, and of course people get kind of funny with that passage of scripture in the way that they want to interpret it. They have him coming down to the earth to set up a kingdom, but the prophecy is that he's going up. Not coming down, he's going up. Well, where did Jesus go? Where did the Son of Man go? Up. Book of Acts, chapter 1, down verse 8 or so, Jesus ascends into heaven. And while they're gazing, of course, the angels tell them, why are you looking? This Jesus that you see going up, he'll come in the same manner. Okay? So Daniel gives us clues about the church. He gives us clues about some, some other things. And he helps us to be able to understand what it means to have true integrity to have true faith the sacrifice that sometimes faith may cost us but that God is with us and that God will help us to overcome and it may not come out the way that we want it to but remember with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when he's getting ready to throw them into the furnace, I'm going to give you one more chance. But God can deliver you from me. And their answer is, God's going to deliver us. Our God will deliver us, one way or the other. You throw us in there, we burn up, we're going to be with God. Amen. You throw us in there, God will deliver us. And what was that story? He's looking in there and he says, Hey, wait a minute. How many people did we throw in there? Three? Why am I seeing four people in there? And the Bible says that what they saw was one like unto the Son of Man. Jesus is always with us, church. Even when we don't think that he is there, he is there. And when we feel that maybe we might be abandoned, he is there. And so God took care of Daniel and his friends because they were faithful. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They witnessed this great, wonderful city. They saw all of the marvelous things that were there, but they paid a terrible price. And even though they paid that terrible price, they remained faithful to their God. For this reason, these young men, all of them, end up serving in high positions of government. Daniel, of course, rises up extremely high. At the age of 18, he's put in charge of a lot of stuff. Nebuchadnezzar is extremely taken with Daniel. And I, I, I don't want to get too much into that 
portion of the story, but I just love it when the king has the dream and in the middle of the night, he calls the enchanters and the magicians because he's so troubled by this dream. And he calls them all together and tells them, tell me what the dream is, tell me what it means. And of course, they say, well, tell us what the dream is, we'll tell you what it is. He says, no, no, you're missing the point. I don't remember the dream, but it's bothering me enough so that I called you. Now fix it. That's their job, you know, is to fix his problems. And of course, they say, nobody, no one. In fact, at one point they say, or oh, something like this. From the beginning of time until now, no man has ever been asked to do this. Because no one can. What I like about the story is that, of course, Daniel hears about it. And as soon as he hears about it, he's, he goes into prayer. No, why is that? Well, because Daniel... And his three friends, they're among those enchanters, magicians, counselors. They're in that group. So Daniel finds out, he, re he was not summoned to the king, but he finds out what the problem is, and what's the first thing that he did? He went to God in prayer. What's the second thing that he did? He called his friends and he said, hey, we got big problems. I need you to pray that this can come about in the right way. So the first thing that he did to solve this problem is he went to God in prayer. The second thing that he does is he calls his friends to pray with him. And then he goes to uh, the, his, his boss, if you will, and he said, we can take care of this. Because God has re let him know that he can take care of it. And I, love, I, I, I love Daniel because Daniel goes before the king. And the king says, you can tell me about what the dream is? No. I can't. Now you have to think about this. His head could be chopped off. And he goes in. And God is going to reveal it to Daniel so Daniel can reveal it to the king. But the king says, you can, you can tell me what it is? No. Why is Daniel standing in front of the king if he can't solve the king's problem? And of course, the rest of the statement is, I can't. But there is a God. And he is the revealer of all things. And you see, through God's word, he starts in Genesis revealing the greatest of mysteries to men. And then he finally reveals him in the person of Jesus in the New Testament. Amen. And so when we are looking through these books and Oh, I don't understand this. It can be understood. You see, <clears throat> one of the things that we should remember is that Daniel is a narration of history. And what is history? History is his story. That's what history is. From Genesis through the end, it's his story. That's what history is. So I hope that you will get involved and want to read that. After you do your due diligence in studying Hebrews with Rod, make sure that you get deep into Daniel, whether it's in a class, whether it is personally, whatever it is, because Daniel is rich 
with telling us how we can live good lives of integrity where we can set good moral boundaries how we can be good faithful servants to God no matter what the consequences may be so I hope and trust that I've said something new for you about Daniel something to encourage you in living your life a life full of integrity as a child of God a life full of faith as a child of God and a life that will not compromise morally with anyone that's one of the greatest problems that we have today is people have compromised over moral issues in our nation and throughout the world that's why the world is so messed up that's why little children are being told that a little boy can be a little girl because we were tolerant and loving as long as they do whatever they do over there and I can't see it I don't care instead of condemning sin and church I'm going to tell you right now that the time has come to return to those old paths and people you see people don't like strong preaching when you tell people that they're going to hell if they do not come why do you think the world is in such a mess why do you think our nation is seeing the immorality that we see it's because of one thing Christians have said oh let's not speak these kinds of things you know back in the 1960s there was a fellow Jim I'm and Rod, you guys probably remember the name Jimmy Allen. And he did a series of, of uh, campaigns throughout the nation. In fact, people dubbed him as the, uh, he's the Billy Graham of the Churches of Christ because tens of thousands of people came to hear him. One of his sermons that he preached, and it was very famous, What is Hell Like? And back then he was preaching that thing and thousands of people were being baptized in this pre with his preaching at these campaigns. And then we became very sophisticated and we said, oh, we shouldn't be doing that type of a thing. And so even Jim and Aaron stopped preaching that. But I watched that, and of course I know Brother Allen has passed now, but I was watching a YouTube the other day, and uh, he says, now I'm gonna preach a sermon. I've dusted it off the shelf because people had told me it was too harsh and this and that, but I'm gonna preach it. And it was his sermon, What Is Hell Like? And he hadn't preached it for close to 20 years because we decided that we wanna be nice to everybody. When you're nice to everyone, when you do not call sin for what sin is, you find that sin is crouching not only at their door, but at yours. And so it's time for us to speak boldly. And that's why Daniel is a good place to start. Stand with integrity, stand with good morality, stand faithful to God and his word. Why was Daniel and his three friends, why were they able to stand so strong? Because they had gone through a great revival under King Josiah. And how shall we stand? It's time for us, church, to begin that revival right where we are, here and now. So I want to encourage you that that is your decision, that you will seek to do all that you can. I expect to hear great things from Apple Valley. I'll be right down the road. I may run up from time to time to chastise you if I do not hear these good things. And of course, I expect you to run down to me once in a while if 
I'm not doing those good things where I'm going to be. So may God bless you. May God keep you. Uh, we love you. And uh, we hope to see you again. But we're anxious to get down south here to get to our new work in Highland. And uh, you're always welcome. Thank you. God bless.